Now, our final speaker this morning before our Q&A is, of course, Lou Rockwell, who needs no introduction to most of you, the founder of the Mises Institute more than 30 years ago, also our chairman. And what I was thinking as we were driving <coughs> last night from the airport is, I'm not sure that since Murray Rothbard died in the 1990s, that there's anyone in the West or anyone in the U.S. Who, for whom we can say has been a more steadfast and consistent anti-state public intellectual than Lou Rockwell, and we appreciate it very much. Lou? Oh, thank you. So I'm going to talk about the libertarian principle of secession. For a century and a half, the idea of secession has been systematically demonized among the American public. The government schools spin fairy tales about the indivisible union and the wise statesmen who fought to preserve it. Decentralization is portrayed as unsophisticated and backward, while nationalism and centralization are made to seem progressive and inevitable. When a smaller political unit wishes, uh, excuse me, when a smaller political unit wishes to withdraw from a larger one, its motives must be disreputable and base, while the motives of the central power seeking to keep that unit in an arrangement it does not want are portrayed as selfless and patriotic if they're discussed at all. As usual, disinformation campaigns are meant to take to make potentially liberating ideas appear toxic and dangerous, conveying the message that anyone who seeks acceptance and popularity ought to steer clear of whatever it is, in this case, secession, the regime has condemned. For when we see a pro but when we set the propaganda aside, we discover the support for secession means simply this. It is morally illegitimate to deploy state violence against individuals who choose to group themselves differently from the way the existing regime chooses to group them. They prefer to live under a different jurisdiction. Libertarians consider it unacceptable to aggress against them for this. The libertarian principle of secession is not exactly embraced with enthusiasm by the people and the institutions I call regime libertarians. Although these people tend to be located in and around the Beltway, regime libertarians are, are, are not a matter of geographic location, which is why I coined this special term for them. The regime libertarian believes in the market economy, more or less. But talk about the Federal Reserve or Austrian business cycle theory, and he gets fidgety. His magazine or institute would far rather invite Janet Yellen to a cocktail reception than Ron Paul to a lecture. The regime libertarian loves the idea of reform, whether it's the Fed, government schools, or whatever, but he flees from the idea of abolition. Why? That's just not respectable. He spends his time advocating this or that tax reform effort, for example, but never discusses the idea of repealing or lowering existing taxes. It's too tough to be a libertarian when it comes to anti-discrimination law, given how much flack one is liable to take over it. So he'll side with left liberals, even though that's completely incompatible with his stated principles. He's anti-war, sometimes. He can be counted on to support the wars, however, that have practically defined the American regime and which remain popular among the general public. He sups in happy concord with supporters of the most egregiously unjust wars, but his blood boils in moral outrage at someone who told an off-color joke 25 years ago. I suppose you can guess where our regime libertarians stand on secession. Since the modern American regime emerged out of the violent suppression of the attempted secession of 11 states, he too is an opponent of secession. If cornered, he may grudgingly endorse secession at a theoretical level, but in practice he generally seems to support only those acts of secession that have the approval or connivance of the CIA. Mention secession and the subject immediately turns to the Southern Confederacy, whose moral enormities the regime libertarian proceeds to denounce. Instead of insinuating that supporters of secession must be turning a blind eye to those enormities. But every libertarian worthy of the name opposes any government support for slavery, centralization, 
inflation, conscription, taxation, or the suppression of speech and press. It goes without saying. We shouldn't be surprised by this kind of charge, though. Accusing libertarians of sympathy for slavery because they oppose wars of centralization is the intellectual cousin of the regime's familiar claim that opponents of the war in Iraq must have secretly supported Saddam Hussein, or that opponents of U.S. intervention in World War I were just apologists for the Kaiser. We expect juvenile nonsense like this from neoconservatives and from the regime itself. When it emerges from the pens of alleged libertarians, it says far more about them and their own allegiances than it does about us. As Tom Woods will point out this afternoon, the classical liberal or libertarian tradition of support for secession boasts such luminaries as Alexis de Tocqueville, Richard Cobden, and Lord Acton, among many others. But I'd like to take, talk about two other figures. In the 19th century, Lysander Spooner, and in the 20th century, Frank Chodorov. Spooner presents a real problem for the regime libertarians. Every libertarian acknowledges the greatness and the importance of Spooner. The trouble is, he was an avowed secessionist. Lysander Spooner was born in Massachusetts in 1808 and went on to become a lawyer, an entrepreneur, and a political theorist. He believed that true justice was not so much a matter of compliance with state, with man-made law, but a refusal to engage in aggression against peaceful individuals. His American letter mail company competed successfully against the U.S. Post Office, offering better services and lower prices until the government forced it out of business in 1851. His work called the unconstitutionality, in his work called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, Spooner argued that the primary interpretive key in understanding the Constitution was what we now call original meaning. This is different from original understanding the concept referred to by figures like Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia. According to this view, we should interpret the Constitution according to the original intent of those who drafted it and ratified the document. Spooner rejected this. What mattered, according to Spooner, was not the inscrutable intention behind this or that word or passage, but the clear meaning of the, the word or passage itself. Furthermore, given that human liberty was a mandate of the natural law, any time constitutional language might appear to run contrary to the principle of liberty, we ought to prefer some other meaning of the word in question, even if we have to strain a bit to do so, and even if the anti-liberty interpretation is the more natural reading. A Spooner could claim, contrary to the majority of abolitionists, that the Constitution was, in fact, an anti-slavery document, and that its unique and its oblique and fleeting references to slavery, and the Constitution never used that word, did not have to carry the meanings commonly attributed to them. Frederick Douglass, the celebrated former slave-turned-abolitionist writer and speaker, adopted Spooner's approach in his own work. Spooner's anti-slavery work went well beyond this exercise in constitutional exegesis, he provided legal services, sometimes pro bono, for fugitive slaves, and advocated jury nullification as a means of defending the escaped slaves in court. His 1858 plan for the abolition of slavery called for insurrection in the South, as well as lesser measures such as flogging slaveholders who themselves used the whip, and encouraging slaves to confiscate their master's property. Spooner's approach was informed by four principles, he said, which with, with which he introduced his plan. One, the slaves have a natural right to their liberty. Two, that they have a natural right to compensation so far as the property of the slave owner can compensate them for the wrongs they have suffered. Three, that so long as the governments under which they live refuse to give them liberty or compensation, they have the right to take it by stratagem or force. Four, that it is the duty of all who can to assist them in this enterprise. Spooner was even a supporter of John Brown and, in fact, raised money and formulated a plan to kidnap the governor of Virginia until Brown was released. In other words, it would be difficult to deny Spooner's dedication to the anti-slavery cause. And yet here is Spooner on the so-called Civil War. Quote, on the part of the North, the war was carried on not to liberate slaves, but by a government that had always perverted and violated the Constitution to keep the slaves in bondage, and was still willing to do so if the slaveholders could thereby be induced to stay in the Union. Louis von Mises gave a succinct expression of the libertarian view of secession when he said, no people and no part of a people shall be held against its will in a political association it does not want. Simple. According to Spooner, the U.S. regime waged the war on behalf of the opposite principle, 
The principle on which the war was waged by the North was simply this, that men may rightfully be compelled to submit to and support a government they do not want, and that resistance on their part makes them traitors and criminals. Spooner continued, No principle that it is possible to be named can be more self-evidently false than this, or more self-evidently fatal to all political freedom. It had triumphed in the field and is now assumed to be established. If it really be established, the number of slaves, instead of having been diminished by the war, has been greatly increased. For a man thus subjected to a government that he does not want is a slave, and there is no difference in principle, but only in degree, between political and chattel slavery. The former, no less than the latter, denies a man's ownership of himself and the products of his labor, and asserts that other men may own him and dispose of him and his property for their own uses and at their own pleasure. Spooner was withering on the Lincoln regime and the northern mythology of the war and its allegedly noble origins. These were all, he said, gross, shameless, transparent cheats, so transparent that they ought to deceive no one. By the logic of the regime libertarian, Spooner must have been a neo-Confederate defender of slavery. After all, he asserted the southern states' right to withdraw from the Union. Uh, but this is too preposterous even for them. Spooner was correct about all this, needless to say. The war was, in fact, launched not to free the slaves, as any historian must concede, but for the purposes of mysticism, why the sacred union must be preserved, and on behalf of economic interests. The regime libertarian expects us to believe that the analysis we apply to all other wars, in which we look beneath the official rationales to the true motivations, does not apply to this single glorious exception to the catalog of crimes that constitute the story of mankind's experience with military aggression. Let's turn now to the second libertarian figure I've chosen to discuss today. Frank Chodorov was one of the great writers of the old right. Liberty Fund publishes a collection of his essays. The Mises Institute publishes some of his books, and they're available in the bookstore today. Chodorov founded what was then called the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, and served as editor of, uh, an editor of Human Events, where the early presence of Felix Morley ensured that non-interventionist voices, at least in the beginning, could get a hearing. Murray and Rothbard considered Chodorov's monthly journal Analysis to be one of the great independent publications in American history. And we're very glad to have the complete run of analysis in the Mises Institute archives. Naturally, Chodorov supported both secession and states' rights. In fact, he thought every school child should, quote, become familiar with the history and theory of what we call states' rights, but which was really just the doctrine of home rule. Ralph Rako, the great libertarian historian and senior fellow of the Mises Institute, has documented how the decentralized political order of Europe made possible the emergence of liberty. The lack of a single political authority uniting Europe, and to the contrary, a vast multiplicity of small jurisdictions, placed a strict limit on the ambition of any particular prince. The ability to move from one place to another meant that a prince would be, lose his tax base if, he, if his oppressions grew intolerable. Chodorov made a similar observation. Quote, when the individual is free to move from one jurisdiction to another, a limit is put on the extent to which the government may use its monopoly power. Government is held in restraint by the fear of losing its tax-paying citizens, just as the loss of customers tends to keep other monopolies from getting too arrogant. Chodorov noted that in the, in the years leading up to the New Deal in 1933, various states embarked upon quasi-socialistic experiments. He referred to a Wisconsin law passed early in the Depression that required restaurants to serve two ounces of Wisconsin-made cheese with every meal, whether the patron wanted it or not. <laughs> he mentioned the platform of the Farm Labor Party, which emerged in several states. What caused these and other schemes to fail was people's ability to move their capital and their physical bodies across state lines. The federal government socialism, on the other hand, in Chodorov's words, could be made to operate somehow only because there was no escape from its constabulary. No tyrant ever supports divided or decentralized power, which is why 20th century totalitarians were such opponents of federalism. By the way, Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf specifically denounces secession and federalism. Um, so the U.S. regime, too, has devoted over two centuries to dismantling the barriers that the states once imposed to the untrammeled exercise of power. 
As Chodorov put it, quote, the unlikelihood of getting the states to vote themselves out of existence turned the centralizers to other means, such as bribing the state authorities with patronage, alienating the loyalties of the citizens with federal subsidies, establishing within the states independent administrative bodies to manage federal works programs. Here's how Chodorov concludes. Quote, there is no end of trouble the states can give the centralizers by merely refusing to cooperate. Such refusal would meet with popular acclaim if it were supplemented with a campaign of education on the meaning of states' rights in terms of human freedom. In fact, the educational part of such a secessionist movement should be given first importance, and those who are plumping for a third party, because both existing parties are centralist in character, would do well to nail to their master this banner, secession of the 48 states from Washington. Now there's a libertarian speaking. Secession is not a popular idea among the political and media classes in America, to be sure, and regime libertarians may roll their eyes at it. But a recent poll found that about a quarter of Americans are sympathetic to the idea, despite the ceaseless barrage of nationalist propaganda emitted from all sides. A result like this confirms what we already suspect, that a substantial chunk of the public is willing to entertain unconventional thoughts. And that's all to the good. Conventional American thoughts are war, centralization, redistribution, and inflation. The most unconventional thought in America today is liberty.